father to the most destructive forces ever plagued across the lands of Sarah, the man who never had enough time, Adam Jonathan Phoenix, tyrant force of the cog and failed savior of the locust. Welcome, ladies and animals, to yet another Gears of War breakdown. Today, we talk about the history, accomplishments, and secrets of Adam Phoenix, father to Marcus, and savior of all life across the surface of Sarah. As always, if you like this video and want more, check out the playlist and subscribe so you're here for all future episodes. We're doing Gears of War lore every Monday. Raised in the Phoenix estate by his own father, Adam was always a curious and featured a scientific mind, even in childhood. Stories like that of Romilly, a young girl who was said to be kidnapped by monsters in the dark, emboldened this aptitude of Adam's. He would climb under his own bed with a flashlight, seeking out these monsters, but concluded their existence was little more than a tall tale after never encountering such beasts. Eventually, Adam Phoenix would go on to study at La Croix University. He picked up a multitude of fields which called to him, everything from physics, weapon design, military technologies, and engineering. He met his wife while in school, eventually known as Elaine Phoenix. 22 years before emergence, their first and only child was born. Marcus was brought into the world. As most citizens of Tyran did, Adam had become enlisted into the COG. It was a struggle, but he managed to balance duties both as Captain Phoenix of the Coalition, Professor Phoenix at La Croix, and Adam Phoenix at home. Elaine and Adam both worked hard to maintain their roles in society and their roles at home. Elaine, a biologist, took great interest in the Hollow, a series of subterranean tunnels that stretched for miles underneath Sarah, claiming that she had seen a variety of species that she believed matched the description of the monsters from the Romilly story. On walks to investigate the hollow, Elaine would bring Marcus with her as the two watched from afar and Miss Phoenix attempted to record a scientific breakthrough in the field of evolution. These discoveries worried Adam, who thought that bad things might happen if Elaine took their four-year-old son into the hollow, especially since she had originally been hiding these things from him. But he had little time to worry, as the front lines called on the captain to resume his duties. While getting new orders, Adam had been offered a job at the DRA, the COG's Defense Research Agency. But Adam declined, thinking himself selfish if he took such a safe job while Gears were dying on the front lines of the war. Called to the front, Adam was sent to lead an invasion into the UIR-aligned country of Kashkur, bordering the neutral state of Vasgar, which was suspected to come under attack by the UIR. He was given control of Howard Company and put on orders to shut down pipelines that led into Vasgar, leaving the neutral nation at a greater risk of invasion and leaving millions of innocent civilians without power during such a tense period of time. Here he was paired with Lieutenant Helena Stroud, mother of Anya Stroud. Just as Adam, she disagreed with the orders, but the two had little choice when it came to disrespecting their superiors. After shutting down the lines, Adam's company was redirected to join at the Battle of Shavad and took heavy casualties from indie resistance that was dug in deep, entrenched within the city. Seeing the death and destruction disturbed Adam. He worried about the state of the world, the museums, art, culture, and history that was being lost in this war. He had heaps of wounded, 20 men dead, and another 20 in need of immediate exfil. But his controller refused medical aid, the teams were busy, and Adam's company was under too much heat for Ravens, COG helicopters. During the siege, Adam and Helena came to the conclusion that the UIR must have had a sniper acting as a spotter in the town's museum, which had towered over their position. He understood that a series of artillery strikes could level the building and remove the issue of a spotter, but it didn't sit right with him. I've just given the order to wipe out 3,000 years of culture. Adam ordered the barrage anyways, finally putting the lives of the gears he was responsible for ahead of the museum. The cover fire worked as a medical team came closer, momentarily halting the artillery strikes in order to load wounded aboard the Ravens. Adam waited until they were clear before ordering the museum to be entirely leveled. 
In the aftermath of the destruction, Adam was appalled. All of the art and culture stored within had been ground to dust and debris. One small statue of a horse remained in the chaos, and he gently debated about taking it to preserve such a piece, but Adam could not bring himself to do so. The company moved on, and Adam had to reorganize the 60 gears which remained into two different platoons, now sent on a mission to hold down a cog-controlled bridge. During the voyage there, the bridge had fallen to the UIR, but Helena managed to keep the company's spirits alive as they vowed to retake it. It was the lieutenant's fervor here that showed Adam Phoenix that she would be a much better leader and perhaps his time would be better spent accepting the deal for the DRA. The next day, Adam disconnected his radio equipment and began to bury one of the gears who died under his command. The body in the dirt, the man who had died, he had a family. Adam didn't feel right leaving for the DRA when men were dying and being failed out on the field. Helena tried to snap him out of it, saying that it would be much better for him to apply his talents somewhere that would be better for humanity and not to worry too much about what other people thought of him. But it could not wait long, as what remained of Adam's company was sent to intercept a UIR convoy at Ragnai, arriving in time to evacuate the city's remaining population before the gunfire began. Howard Company intercepted four UIR APCs and destroyed two of them, letting the other two flee back home. Adam was now informed that the COG intel was failing them, as the two APCs they barely managed to take on were just scouts, with another convoy 20 vehicles large on the way, including UIR tanks, which Adam and his team would be ill-prepared to take on. Helena devised a plan of creating Molotov cocktails and ambushing the tanks, aided by Adam and other gears. They were able to immobilize the tank and toss the firebombs into a rear vent cooking the crew from the inside out. During the scuffle, Adam took a shot to the leg, putting him out of the fight as he watched more and more gears get taken out. Thankfully, not long after, reinforcements had arrived and finished off the convoy, but not before Howard had taken heavy losses. With a total headcount of 48, Adam was livid. He had lost 52 men and women to this mission, 52 sons and daughters and mothers and fathers, 52 souls who were sent to their death by commanders who refused to hear his pleads for help and sent them on their way regardless. Adam could not contain his rage. He was clear enough to Helena that he intended to take the job at the DRA and create a super weapon that could end this war once and for all. You're going to get yourselves killed, both of you. Come on, Dad. I've come to get you out of here. I've got to save my research. Do you understand how important it is? Coming back home on crutches, Adam was happy to tell his wife Elaine of his promotion to major, but that he wasn't close to retirement. As well as himself, Helena had been promoted to captain. He was worried about Marcus's development, but promised to be more present in his son's life unlike Adam's own father. He told Elaine of his plans to develop a weapon that could stop leaders from sending their sons to their deaths miles away while never being at risk themselves. There will be deterrents. There will be weapons that mean politicians stupid enough to carry on this war are going to face the same risk of dying as the men and women they send to fight it. I'm going to create those weapons. I'll make these ghastly little demagogues think twice. Eight years on, Adam had continued his work at the DRA and was informed of the disappearance of his wife, Elaine. He had made sure it was classified and told Marcus about it while he was with the Santiago family. At home, Adam would tell Marcus that his mother had simply gone missing, but with enough questions that went unanswered, Marcus quickly put together that his father was lying and soon after opted to spend more time with the Santiago's. From here, the bond between the two of them was skewered. Adam would only ever confide in a friend of his, admitting that he knew the lie was killing the relationship with his son, but he was just unsure of how to tell him. Curious of his wife's own fate, Adam had begun to dig through Elaine's belongings before finding notes leading into the hollow. He ventured in himself, finding the remains of a skeleton with enough effects on it to confirm that they had belonged to his wife. While underground, Adam Phoenix was captured by the Locust and brought before the Queen. 
This would be the first time any human outside of the New Hope research facility or Reyna had seen the Queen in the flesh. She explained the origins of the Locust Horde to Adam and asked for his help to save the Locust from the Lambent possession that had driven strife into their home. Seeing an opportunity to avoid another war, Adam felt responsible to give it his best shot and promised the Locust Queen that he would find a cure to Lambency so that they wouldn't have to invade the surface. He had continued contact with her for years up until E-Day, but he had never told anyone else, including the chairman of this grievous secret, that he had come across in the hollow. Wait, wait, wait. Did I hear right? The government knew E-Day was coming and none of you bothered to warn us? No, just me. Even Prescott didn't know. Not until much later. I had so many ideas. Just too little time. Five years on from here, Marcus would come to inform his father that he had intended to join the army. Of course, apprehensive, Adam avoided trying to deny Marcus's path, admitting that he knew a further divide between the two of them would kill the relationship for good. He tried briefly to ask Carlos Santiago, Marcus's childhood friend, to talk him out of it, but Carlos instead just promised to enlist beside Marcus and keep him safe from harm. Soon after, Adam gave a speech at LaCroix University where he revealed much of the mannerisms towards design he had picked up on. He was critical of how comfortable the war was for the COG, that their strategy mostly consisted of making bigger, tougher guns and slapping them on bigger, bulkier tanks. Instead, he opted for a strong sense of aerial superiority, to use devices that were more mechanically and strategically advanced. Four years before emergence, Adam Phoenix had begun working with another scientist by the name of Dr. Neville Eastrom, a passionate man who always wanted to join the army but never could. Failing all of the fitness qualifications for the COG, Adam would be adamant about how their work at the DRA was just as important as the front lines and that the Hammer of Dawn orbital weapon could win all of them the war. At the same time, News of the UIR developing the same type of technology had reached them, with Adam Phoenix realizing they were behind their enemies in terms of progress. They couldn't get the right level of focus for their targeting beam, making the hammer useless from orbit. Meeting with many higher-ups in the COG to find a way to steal the UIR's tech for their own, with reports noting that the base where research was being conducted had stepped up its defenses, indicating to them that the UIR were close to completing the project. While they planned out a diversion to split off UIR defenses and send their own force to capture the plans, Adam was asked by one Agent Louise Settil about the UIR's researchers, if they should capture them or execute them. It was a heavy question for Adam. He worried about the ramifications. Tuning out before Louise demanded an answer, Adam conceded that if left alive, the UIR's own scientists could restart the project in a matter of years and they'd be back to square one. It was decided, but Adam was still holding a grudge by the idea of them executing civilians. Another officer at the meeting, General Ivor, called Adam out on this, proclaiming Adam as a hypocrite for worrying about the moral implications of soldiers on the ground while he developed weapons of mass destruction in an office. This is when the COG began to draw up plans for Operation Leveler. The UIR's base of operations in Hammer of Dawn technology was to be impregnated and raided by COG commandos in the infantry division known as C Company, the same company that Marcus and Carlos belonged to. The mission was concluded swiftly and expertly, with Captain Victor Hoffman leading the commandos as he and Dominic Santiago made their way into the base and executed the scientists. But the battle did claim lives, such as Helena Stroud and Carlos Santiago remembered by their kin. In the next three years, Adam and Neville finally created a version of the Hammer of Dawn weapon that was devastating, wiping a mock town off of the map in seconds. The results were brought to the chairman, who immediately vouched for a surprise attack. Adam objected. Knowing the UIR could never defend against such a weapon, he asked for the UIR to be given a fair warning before the first firing, to which the chairman agreed. Unfortunately, UIR Premier Yuri Dushenko did not believe the COG warning, and the full might of the UIR was applied at the Battle of Bonberg, where the hammer was used to split half of the UIR's 3rd Naval Fleet 
and send them to the bottom of the sea. The beam came from the sky. It was impossible to defend against, and even the largest battleships folded in half, melting down the middle as they were cut from starboard to port. Dushenko submitted the UIR surrender in a matter of hours before the hammer could be used on their cities. For his efforts, Adam received the Octus Medal, the COG equivalent of the Nobel Prize. People cheered. The UIR was officially surrendered by the end of the week. Celebrations roared through the streets of Jacinto, but Adam stayed focused on another project, an unknown enemy that would come for them in a matter of time, the Locust. He debated on whether or not to tell Chairman Daylil about the threat, but he kept it to himself, thinking he could find an alternative solution to the Lambency problem before things got out of hand. But before he had a chance to even begin, he was already out of time. This is the only one. Mira would wait no longer for Adam's correspondence, and with Uzo Ram at her side, the Locust invasion began in Janermont. The death and destruction was devastating. For more on Emergence Day itself, check out the video I've done on it here. For Adam, not much would change up until a year into the war. Chairman Prescott gathered his colonels and Phoenix to come up with a plan to stop the Locust threat. All of their reports concluded the COG could only hold out for a single month or so. This is when Prescott asked if Adam's weapon could strike all across the globe at once. The inference was obvious. Prescott wanted to torch the globe. Adam rejected the idea, acknowledging that millions more would die at their own hands, that the hammer was meant to be a deterrent, but with no other option to handle the threat, his will was overturned and the Kong continued forth with a plan to strike the surface clean. Adam programmed the satellites to fire in stages, slowly grazing entire cities off of the map. Destruction we can see firsthand in a city like Char, where people were hit by the hammer strikes and frozen in place. Their fear, their lives, made into statues of dead ash by the government that cared only for the survival of humanity in the face of inhuman monsters. The only other option Adam could think of was a plan he devised to sink specific seawalls along the coast of Tyrus, flooding the hollow and probably not killing the locust, but at least slowing them down. But with time running on the clock that they just couldn't spare, Prescott agreed to go forth with the strikes. The people of Sarah were given three days warning. Councils in the COG objective, one woman specifically, Janine Morris, erupted with outrage at Adam for allowing such a devastating attack to be carried out against their own people, claiming that he had nothing to lose. Adam objected in return, as his own son Marcus was very much on the front line out in the field. Just before the strikes were made, Adam Phoenix had sent a car to the Santiago household, collecting Maria and bringing her to the Phoenix estate. He apologized to Marcus when he had seen him next, saying that he was simply worried for her well-being. Marcus would pass the message on to Dom and told Adam about how the Lancer's standard bayonet was not strong enough to break through the locust hide. He then told Adam the story of Ty Kaliso, which led to the creation of the Mark II Lancer and the now famous Chainsaw Bayonet. When time came for leaders of Sarah to turn their keys on the apocalypse, they gathered in suit. The only one who hesitated was Victor Hoffman, worried for his wife who had left the safe zone to look for their son. Adam pleaded with the colonel, offering to turn the key for him. If you prefer, Victor, give me the key. I'll do it. Like you said, it's my bomb. Hoffman declined, saying that it was his duty, and with the turn of only three keys, the strikes would begin. The surface of Sarah was irreversibly damaged. Ashen gray snow fell across the entire surface of the planet. Shortly after the blasts, Adam Phoenix and Chairman Prescott surveyed the damage together on a raven, speaking about how they might kill the locust. It was clear they would not all be dead, with most of them hiding underground. Prescott tried to peer in on how Adam never revealed a lot of hate for the locust, rather sympathy as he explained he could never hate something. But he was worried that the only way they could defeat the locust would be by exterminating them. 
but you can't save them. Ten years into the Locust War, the Cog's attempt at victory had been futile. Eventually, the war came to a turning point in Ephira, where the Phoenix Estate was. During the battle for a major bridge into the city, Adam would send a distress signal to Marcus who was fighting on said bridge. He claimed to have important information for the Cog, and that his life was in danger. Against the wishes of his superiors, Marcus fled his post and went to save his father. During the Battle of Ephira, Adam was supposedly killed and his research lost for the next four years. Instead, he was kidnapped by the Onyx Guard on behalf of Richard Prescott and taken prisoner to Azura, an island resort bunker for the brightest and wealthiest of the Cog's population to wait out the war. Marcus was imprisoned and sentenced to 80 years in prison, but the sentence was dropped to 40 by Adam who pleaded to Prescott that Marcus be eased on, or he would refuse to work on a solution to the Locust issue. During his time on Azura, Adam was isolated and began to work with Emulsion, trying to find a way to end the sickness. After Jacinto fell and remnants of the Cog fled all the way across the globe, Prescott ran away from his own people, escaping into the night with his Onyx Guard back to Azura, bringing with him some more advanced Lambit samples for Adam Phoenix to study. Adam struggled, trying to find a way that he could eliminate the Lambent life forms while keeping both humanity and the Locust intact. But it was evolving, and he could not keep up. Emulsion didn't create a sickness, it was the sickness. It was alive. And it would not stop until everything on Sarah was Lambent. Eventually, when desperate and out of options, Adam began to inject emulsion into his own veins, choosing to sacrifice his own body in order to study the Lambent life cycle and how it operates. He was offered prisoners of war and vagabonds to test on, but ethical as always, Adam continued to test on himself. A year and a half later, Mira had found Azura. She captured the island and executed every last survivor home to the base, but kept Adam alive asking him to continue his work but ensure the device he was making would not kill the Locust. Prescott was one of the few who escaped Azura, finding Marcus and revealing to him that Adam was alive, setting in motion the events in Gears of War 3. But while trapped in his research, Adam Phoenix could not separate the Locust's DNA from Emulsion as it was too integral to their species' foundations. When Delta Squad came to Azura, Adam was figuring out the final touches to his machine, devastated that he could not do it all, claiming he never had enough time. The rest of his work was kept and passed on to Damon Baird to be used in the future. We better get going. If the emulsion hadn't reached a critical stage, I might have found a way to save the Locust as well, and they could have gone back underground. Tell me you don't feel sorry for them. Responsible, not sorry. It's my fault they're here, Marcus. I failed to stop the emulsion spreading all those years ago. It drove the Locust out of their warrens. I tried to persuade Mira to keep her people underground, but they couldn't. So then- Wait, wait, wait. Did I hear right? The government knew E-Day was coming, and none of you bothered to warn us? No, just me. Even Prescott didn't know. Not until much later. I had so many ideas. Just- too little time. Dad, stop this. Come on. Whoa. What else don't we know? You're a scientific man. Look at this later and try to understand what I wanted to do and what I had to do. Yo, there's talking, more walking. With the Lambent growing stronger than ever and the threat of emulsion infecting human hosts, time was running short for humanity. Escorted by Delta, Adam pushed to the top of the tower where his device was, activating the emulsion countermeasure while Delta fended off Queen Mira and her war beetle known as the Tempest. As the device began, it encircled the globe, sending out a metaphysical shockwave that destroyed all emulsive cells across Sarah, killing the Lambent and shutting down the Locust for the time being. The only one remaining standing was Mira, survived by her human DNA. But Adam's fate was sealed. The emulsion in his veins too far spread for him to be saved. He was glad to have seen Marcus again, but succumbed to the might of his own device. In Marcus's hands, 
He crumbled to dust not unlike the millions of poor souls who perished at the hands of the weapons that he had created. Mira scolded Adam from the ashes of her own defeat before being executed by Marcus Phoenix. Adam's life was over, but his legacy would endure. He lamented his role as a catalyst to destruction, but as Marcus put it, Marcus, I'm responsible for so many deaths. This is where I can put some things right. You didn't start this war. You're ending it. Adam likely agreed, but killing all the Locust was far from a positive outcome in his own mind. Adam Phoenix was remembered by the whole of the Cog, who would go on to take the symbol of a literal phoenix as their emblem going forward, rather than the skull that had been used for at least the last 50 years now. The man with too little time, who was the architect to the death of millions, and whose sacrifice of millions more saved humanity. Adam Phoenix is my favorite character in Gears of War. A man who just wants to make peace in a world encased by war, and whose only contribution to the world was more weapons that were used to kill. I enjoy his loyalty to peace and ethics, how he asked for the UIR to be warned before the hammer was used, how he tried to help the Locust without outing them, as revealing Mira to the Cog early would have likely have ended in a war regardless, how he mourned the loss of culture in Kashkur and felt responsible for the fate of the Locust who he genuinely, honestly, had tried to save even after they had killed his wife and billions more to humanity. Adam was loyal to his own kind, to his son, and to the people who unfortunately died at the hands of the tools that he created. But above that, he was loyal to his ideas and to hope that his children wouldn't have to fight or his children's children could live in a world without war. A hope that never died with him as his ultimate sacrifice took no lives but his own and gave the children of Sarah a tomorrow. I'm glad I was able to see you again, Marcus. Now go and live for me. God! He's gone. He's gone. And with that, this is the end of the video. The life and accomplishments of Adam Phoenix, the man who cared in a world filled with misery. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel for even more coming every week. And as always, hope runs deep. Stay cool, have fun, and be awesome. Buster out. Oh, man, that was nasty.